Hey everybody, Brad Geiger here. Dave and I are thrilled to welcome a new sponsor to the show this week, Bonjuro at Bonjuro.com. That's B-O-N-J-O-R-O.com. What is Bonjuro, you ask? Well, I got to tell you, Dave and I both use it and we are uh, huge fans of it. We're so thrilled to have them here as a sponsor. What Bonjuro enables you to do is this. When somebody, for example, becomes a new Patreon backer or they buy a piece of original art or they sign up for your mailing list, you Bonjuro pings you. They make it so easy. They ping you and they say, hey, send this person a video message. You get out your phone, point the, uh, the video end at you, and you say, hey, Ben, for example, thank you so much for becoming a Patreon backer. You record a quick message to this person. You hit send. Bonjuro takes care of all the rest, and this new Patreon backer gets a personalized video message where you look them in the eye, use their name, and say thank you for being a part of this thing that I'm doing. You are going to be amazed at the effectiveness of using Bonjuro on all of your different pursuits, whether it's Patreon, Kickstarter, original art, mailing lists, you, you, you name it, Bonjuro can do it. And they send out these amazingly effective personalized video messages that are super easy to do. You just do it. Well, uh, Dave does it when he's out there walking his dog. Uh, <laughs> that's that's what that's how kind of, what what a great multitasker Dave is. I don't have a dog, so I have got to do mine in the studio. But listen, it's a fantastic way to make a new reader or a new backer or a new client feel like an old friend. Now here's the deal: you can sign up for a 14-day free trial at Bonjuro.com. That's not a big deal. They do that for everybody. But if you're a Comic Lab listener, listen to this. If you're a Comic Lab listener, after your 14-day trial is up and it's time to seal the deal, look for the coupon field and enter Comic Lab March. All one word, Comic Lab March. And they'll give you 20% off Bonjuro for life. You're, you're, you get a discount for life from this. This is an amazing opportunity. And by the way, after 14 uh, days, you're going to realize that you're going to be using Bonjuro for the rest of your creative life. It's just that good. We're so thrilled to have them as a new sponsor. They're over at Bonjuro.com, B-O-N-J-O-R-O. And now let's start the show. Brad, I was making my coffee this morning, and my yeah. uh, I went to push my glasses up on my nose, realized I was not even wearing glasses. So my brain was looking for a clarity that was not there, was not possible. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. I've been there. My brain was like, no, I want, I want, this This could be fixed. This could be better. Nope, no glasses there. Nothing on my nose. <laughs> there's no There's no more focus to be had here. Yeah, this is the best we can do. That was what my, yeah. my eyes response was. Look, champ, we're all doing our best here. This is all, this is all we got to work with. <laughs> How old did you say you are? Oh, Brad. Well, we're starting right out of the gate with the insults. Thank you, my friend. Well, have you started looking for your glasses on your head and, and you realize you're not wearing them up there either? Or you start- I, one of my favorite comics that I ever did, uh, uh, it's such a stupid joke, was one of my characters walking around going, hey, have you seen my glasses? And they're like, yeah, glasses on your forehead. And then later on the day, he's like, geez, I can't find my keys. Keys are up on top of his head. I just, for whatever reason, that made me laugh. Oh, that's a beautiful. Stupid, stupid physical joke. But uh, anyway, there you go. There you have it. Anyway, on that note, I'm going to say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics. And making a living from comics, I'm Brad Kiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the cartoonist of Evil Inc. And I'm his pal, Dave Kelly, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave, let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. And I've got a topic that I wanted to pitch to you because yeah. I thought this would be a fun way to talk about uh, how to frame your art career in, in broad strokes kind of a, a way. Um, so one is that you have a different goal in your cartooning than you have a job in cartooning. And here's my oh. idea. So your goal as an artist is to get out your authentic message of you, of who you are and what you want to say onto the page. That's your goal, right? Yeah. But your job is different from your goal. Your job as an artist <laughs> is to make sure that the message is understandable, 
that it's enervating, that it's ultimately artistically entertaining, and that it gets the message across. So your goal is to be authentically you, to say authentically what you want to say. But sometimes that is in conflict with what your job is as an artist, which is to make it relevant, make it enervating, make it interesting, and make it entertaining on some level, right? Yeah. Yeah, your job is to communicate. That's what it, at, at, at the base level, your job is to communicate a thought clearly. Your right. goal may be com- completely different. Your goal may be the, uh, very much more lofty than that. It, it might be all kinds of subtext, and, and, and it might be this, this uh, vision of beauty that doesn't actually exist in, in your work yet. But your goal is that. Your job is to communicate. And, that's, and I, and I got to tell you, between the two, Dave, which do you think is more important, the goal or the job? Well, I will be honest, and I think at towards the beginning of your career, I think the the working on the goal of your cartooning is the important part. But then in year five, six, seven, and as you transition into trying to take it more seriously as a like, mm-hmm. now I am a, trying to be a cartoonist that's building and growing and working in this industry. I think it has yeah. to, the focus then switches to your job as a cartoonist rather than your goal, you know, because Mm -hmm. initially art is about self-expression. You're like, how do I say what do I, what I want to say? How do I get my heart on the page? So that's the first couple of years of your career. But then Mm -hmm. you realize that there are artful ways to get your heart on the page or more (laughs) effective ways to get your heart on the page. And then you realize that the job, the work of it is making it um, understandable, make it entertaining, make it enervating, make it uh, authentic in a way that that uh, engages people where they are and not uh, yeah. and not loses them because uh, I guess what I'm saying is your true self, your authentic self um, is has to run through a prism of shared experiences of of the parlance of the day. And in so doing, then you then it becomes more of a job. How do I make what I feel inside that's all bottled up that feels so real and true when it, and is authentic how do i make that a communication event with other people yeah i uh, i so if i said that i believe after hearing everything you just said that it's actually the opposite what would you say to that i would say i want to hear no, i know i genuinely was well, one of the reasons why i pitched this as, a, as an idea topic today so yeah go ahead what i, I agree with everything you said but if that's the case then you've got to concentrate on your job first before you can reach your goals in that when you're first starting out, you're prop like you're probably starting out the same way that I started out in the same way Dave started out. We weren't very good at this and we no. had to work really hard just to communicate an idea, right? Yeah. We had to yeah. work at composing the word balloons in the right order. We had to work on doing the craft of cartooning right. That's where things like the crossbar eye rule come into play right, and getting right. the, the the characters in the right speaking positions, all of that stuff. We had to work on communicating first because uh, uh, before you really learn the, the the craft of comics, you are not communicating. The, you, you, and, and same thing, by the way, with writing. If you're writing humor and you're writing punchlines that don't land, that's a classic case of not communicating. Right. Uh, and, and so I, I would argue perhaps that although you're exactly right, what that means is first you've got to concentrate on the job. And once you're doing your job as a cartoonist really well, only then can you start to approach your goals. Huh. This is interesting. I uh, <laughs> I don't disagree with you, especially the way you laid that out. Yeah. So I'm wondering, and and this is a counter proposal. Are we both right that you have to you have to work at both, and it's a it's a rising tide of oh. of two hands working in tandem. You yeah. Know? Like a like yeah like a little like bit here, a little bit there. Like the left hand has to help the right hand. The right hand has to help the left hand. Maybe, maybe. Uh, although I, I, now I, I'll be honest, though, I'm going to be humble about it. <laughs> I think your description <laughs> is more accurate than mine. The more I think about it now. Yeah, uh, I, that I you think, you I do think... have to apply the workman like uh, approach to it, and then yeah. the artistry can come through once you've yeah. mastered the craft of it. Is what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah, and only then, only once you've mastered the ability to do uh, to do your craft well. Again, writing, uh, art, uh, composition, and I would, as I've argued in the past, uh, these days, even things like social media and crowdfunding are part of the job of being a cartoonist. Right. Only after you've mastered all of those things, uh, should you, I'll even go one step further, only after you've mastered those, should you 
start worrying about those loftier goals, because if you don't, you can really trip yourself up. So let me ask you this. Uh, as a way of thinking about it is is yeah. when someone has done the they've worked on the goal of their cartooning without the job of their cartooning. Right. Mm -hmm. So they've, they've, mm -hmm. they're really pouring their heart out on the page, but the yeah. craft is not there yet. Is yes. that when comics feel ham handed when you're like, yes. all right, yeah, we all see what you're trying to do, but you don't need to, <laughs> to clonk us over the head with it. Right. That is 80 percent of pro-am comics that are uh, that you're seeing on your social media feed every day. Uh, it is replete with with heart. In, in other words, you can tell that they are really passionate about this. And uh, I I think we all respond to that raw passion to a degree. Right. right. But you sit there and you look at that and you say, you know what? You're not going to be able to uh, you're not going to be able to communicate that passion until you do your job as a cartoonist. And that means focusing on the basics. Right. Well, I'm glad I brought this up as a topic because I yeah. I think that I I was falling asleep last night. I had this idea that you know your goals are obviously in competition with your with your job, and I yeah. legitimately thought that goal would be the one that people would need to work on first. And you have actually changed my mind from what I what I thought was <laughs> my strong pitch on this. And it just goes to show that I'm continuing to learn from you uh, about uh, about how to think of my own cartooning. So thank you. Uh, well, I appreciate that. So Dave, uh, I see you've also got something over there. Uh, uh, it, it says uh, here, Department of Corrections. Uh, why don't oh, you go ahead? Oh, I do ahead. have something on the do -do 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 Department of Corrections. Because as you know, Brad, uh, Comic Lab is a fact-based show. We always try to, to to keep the specifics of facts. And uh, yes, we heard indeed. from uh, from Gary Terrell over at Fleen that uh, Gene Yang has, in fact, already won a MacArthur Genius Grant. I forgot, I guess. I yeah. totally forgot that Gene Yang had won. So first, Gene, congratulations if you're listening. I'm a moron <laughs> and forgot that you won a MacArthur Genius Grant. Uh, secondly, thank you to Gary for correcting us on that because, Brad, we're a fact-based show. It's a fact-based yes. show that's built yes. on the solidity of common truths, right? <laughs> <laughs> and facts matter, indeed. That, that's what right. would the apps now? If if Gene won the MacArthur Genius Grant, uh, uh, you and I for not knowing that. What's the opposite of a genius grant? There is is there a, a moron grant out there that we could have won? Uh, no, it's called recording a podcast in your sweats. That's what it's called. That's that's what we've won, Brad. We've won recording a podcast in your sweats. All right, Brad, I've got a question for you from Daryl Manley over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And yeah. Daryl writes, hey, Brad and Dave, when I checked my Twitter feed this morning, I was greeted with an encouraging tweet from Grad, Grad Biger. Grad that's what Biger? I almost said. Grad <laughs> Biger. Hmm, that's a, that's a nice alternate universe version of you. Uh, I was greeted with an encouraging tweet from Brad Geiger about spending as much time as it takes to make your comic good before mm -hmm. posting it. Being worried about my ability to maintain an update schedule, this motivated me to start posting my comics sooner rather than waiting until I have more pages <laughs> finished. But I don't have a website yet. I'm thinking of using Tapas to host my archive in the meantime and obviously sharing my comic across social media. But is there anything else I should be doing while I'm sans website? Good use of sans. I plan yeah. on getting my own site once I have the funds, but I have a baby on the way so I don't have have a time frame yet. I understand that. Thank you guys yeah. so much in advance. All right. So Brad, Daryl's question, uh, mainly asking about uh, like, hey, listen, the, the website's not up and running yet. Yeah. Um, where should I put it? How should I host it? But I did appreciate Derek or Daryl that uh, that you said um, Brad was encouraging you to slow down and take the time you need. Yeah. So I hurried up and posted that as quick as I could. <laughs> right? Yeah. Let's, of that made let's me not laugh. drift. Let's not drift past that. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's let's rewind a little bit. The right. whole point, Dave, Dave uh, or Daryl, the whole point of that tweet was to say, take the time you need to make it good before you put it out. That your, your what you took away from that was, I need to start posting right now. Uh, it, don't do that. You 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 actually. You, I, I, I'm going to say you made a big mistake in in starting to post this stuff before you were ready. Uh, and now, uh, as you see, you're 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 having problems uh, as a result of that. Right. So just to remind you, what Daryl said was being worried about my ability to maintain an update schedule. This motivated me to start posting my comics sooner rather than waiting. <laughs> yes. And so uh, that's interesting because basically that's saying anxiety about one's schedule yeah. made Daryl jumpstart uh and maybe that was impending fatherhood, Daryl. That that might be the case. Yeah. You're like, well, I, I, listen, the next six months are going to be higgledy piggledy for me, so yeah. I'm going to get up whatever I can get up. Which I, I I understand, but I think what Brad is saying is it's okay to take the time you need before you launch, yes. before you get things up. 
to make sure you're feeling good about it, to make sure you've gotten your sea legs with the look and the feel of the characters and the and the comic, right? I'm, yeah. I'm assuming, Brad, I actually didn't see the tweet inter- exchange between you no. two. No, he, he, I, I don't know the tweet that he's talking about, uh, to be honest with you. I, although I do say on Twitter quite a bit, listen, uh, a, a, we can make really big mistakes by trying to hold ourselves to an update schedule that may be unrealistic or, right. you know, is is kind of like we feel it's written in stone. And as I've said so many times uh, in the past, we really do consider that update schedule as a holdover from the old advertising dominated uh, web comics days in the early two right. thousands. And I've said a lot on this show. I don't think that applies anymore. Your, your perspective uh, reader is sitting in front of, of a smorgasbord of content with a conveyor belt. And there's just content, 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 content going past. They're not going to notice that you didn't update at three o'clock today. They're just not. You're going to catch them three o'clock tomorrow or, or you know, four o'clock tomorrow. So let me ask you a specific about that. So they're yeah. having a smorgasbord coming, you know, comic, 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 right? Yeah. Uh, is it more dangerous to be um, the forgotten cartoonist in the sense that they've they've followed you, but your comics aren't coming across because you haven't updated a couple of days? Or is it more dangerous to put out a couple of bad comics in a row because you rushed it? Uh, oh. And in so doing, they might unfollow because you're like, nah, that's just not what I thought it was going to be. Do you know of, what I mean? Of the, you, you make a fantastic point. Of the two, obviously, that second is a killer because now yeah. you're you're losing you're losing interest. You're losing reader. I'll tell you what else. Uh, I really do think that uh, you get a reputation with uh, with people. And I'll tell you exactly what I mean. There are certain people that I see their comics and I know they get wordy. And I know they get verbose and I know having seen their stuff often enough in the past, the more verbose they get, the weaker that punchline is. So when I see their work, Brad is looking see, right at me, by the way, this is a, he's directly <laughs> staring into the camera. <laughs> this is not you. I don't know you're why safe, he's holding safe. up the, the word Dave on a piece of paper. <laughs> I'm holding oh, up says, my Sheldon speaking book. about Dave. Okay. That's interesting. That's, I, didn't, I didn't see that coming. Small flop no, sweat I'm, on my brow. I, at, at a certain point I've come to uh, associate that person's art style. And when I see Huge word balloons or huge narrator boxes filled with text. I, I skip the comic because I know this person cannot, this person, <laughs> the more verbose they get, the weaker that punchline. The punchline is a throwaway every time. And I start to just scroll past it without even slowing down because I've been disappointed so many times in the past. I don't even, it, it, I don't even read this person's stuff anymore, right? Uh, it, you can get a reputation when you keep putting out bad stuff. I know we're temporarily stepping away from Daryl's question here, but there is a, a legitimate return on investment that readers yeah. are gauging when they see how much text they have to read. Yep. And so to Brad's point, the payoff, the punchline or whatever the final delivery better deliver on that investment of time that they've made, right? Because time yeah. is one of the things we all lack in our day. And so yeah. if you have a comic that takes two minutes to read, but the, the payoff is whack, oh. whack, you're like, all right, well, oh all right, God. I'll, I'll try yeah. again another day. Oh, it's another long read. Ah, oh, geez, Louise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's not to say that you have to do the Jim Davis rule with Garfield, that it's only right. 25 words or less for every comic strip. But what Brad's saying is there is a, there is a, a quiet mental calculation that people make of like, I don't know. This is an awful lot of text. This really better be worth it as a punchline. That's the phrase. Is this going to be worth it? I see those big balloons and I'm like, is this going to be worth it? No, chances are it's not. Next. <laughs> Somewhere there's a cat video. But let's uh, let's take a look at the actual question <laughs> that Daryl was asking. Right. Uh, so basically he's saying, where do I host my stuff? Right. Uh, and it is important as much as we've argued that social media has turned into publishing uh, it is important to have a place on the web that you control, a place where all your archives are, because obviously it's easy to miss some of your stuff on social yes. media. And if you do succeed in get, getting somebody enthralled in your work to the extent that they want to read more, you need a place where they can easily do that. Right. Now, Tapas, I've talked about in the past, uh, Tapastic, they they ran afoul of me several years ago when they did a, a, a unilateral change of their terms of service 
and, and their terms of service. Did I ever tell you about this, Dave? They they changed it, and then all of a sudden, it said that they gave themselves right of first refusal right. if you use tapastic. Right. I, you, you, you did tell me about that. Yeah. Yeah. And their reasoning was, well, we've seen so many artists make bad uh, contracts. They, I mean, they're deciding this. We're here they're, to help. Deci- right, Brad? Yeah. yeah. And and we see you doing it wrong. And uh, so we've given ourselves right of first refusal. As we're the actually paternalistic doing this. presence in your life, young artist, yes. we're here to yes. help you. Yeah. For your own good. Don't for worry about good. that money stuff. We'll take care of that for you. Yeah. Yeah. At that point, I was experimenting with mirroring my stuff on both Tapastic and Webtoons. I jumped out at Tapastic for two reasons. Number one, that kind of stuff really rubs me the wrong way. Number two, when I was comparing it to the uh, uh, to the traction I was getting at Webtoons, it was easy to make the choice between the two. I'm like, okay, I can do it without Tapas. I wasn't getting a lot of traction there. Uh, Webtoons, I was getting a lot more traction. The obvious thing there is that if you look at Webtoons, you see that they've got, there's one type of comic that does really, really, really well there. It's an anime style. It, it tends to lean towards the romance, and that's great. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're far away from that, you've got to adjust your expectations. Right. Uh, but I was still getting, and still am, getting very good, uh, very good traction on Webtoons. You do have to post in a vertical scroll. I and that's part I, I, for the first several years. I was posting full pages there and and not doing well. Uh, if I had that to do over again, I would be posting nonstop vertical scroll. Uh, so don't make the mistake I did. But you can use webtoons, and it's very easy, uh, Dave, to to build your own website using a number of tools that are easily available to you. Right. Well, and even before that, Daryl, the the helpful, easy, easy, easy solution that I would suggest is just register a URL and then redirect yeah. it to wherever you're going to temporarily host this site. The reason why I say use a redirect is it'll cost you $8, right, for the year, $7, $10, whatever it is now, I don't remember. Uh, you don't have to pay for hosting. You could put it up on Tapas or on Webtoons or on Go Comics or on this or that. Doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Tumblr, I, I literally don't care. But <laughs> the the key point is that the redirect is what you're promoting. The redirect is where people are remembering to go to. So, for example, it's uh, uh, Daryl dot com. Right. That's that's the yeah. website. And then no matter where you move it, and when you eventually build and and purchase and and construct your own website. Uh, then Daryl.com goes to to that site and and you've lost nothing in terms of um, people that have bookmarked or saved that uh, link and uh, yeah. you're good to go. So that I think is the first step is own and control your own URL and send everything through that URL as a redirect. Absolutely. And when you're ready to start your website, it really isn't that hard. Uh, don't Don't avoid making a website because you think you can't do it. Because the fact of the matter is, uh, you probably can. Number one, there are sites like Squarespace uh, that that you can easily build uh, a website using pre-existing tools. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of using, and I and I endorse these guys, even though they don't pay me to do it. Uh, DreamHost is my uh, host of choice. They've got something called a one-click WordPress install. So you install WordClick, a uh, Word. Press with a click, little you just press a button and they install it on your ser- on your uh, site, and then you go to uh, and I swear by this one now to Checky T O O C H E K E. That is a uh, content management system specifically for comics. Uh, y- you download the theme and the plugin. You use them both. Uh, it's very very easy. And uh, if you go to to Checky.com and you're if you're having trouble. Uh, get in touch with Brian over there and he'll do what he did for me. He'll help you right out and get you, get you going. Once you've got that like, set up. I know it's weird, but uh, yeah. it shouldn't make it weird that when there is a single name that can help you out, but it sounds like a small business. Like you're going to want to <laughs> ask for Brian. He's going to set you up over there. He's going to, you tell him Brad Geiger came in. I asked about the transmission last week. You tell Brian, you're having some trouble. He's going to set you right up. You're going to be, you know what I mean? Like we're so used to this corporate world where like, you know, you put yeah. it on with customer support. They're going to ping you in a day, but it's funny when you're like, no, no, no. You ask Brian, you tell him Brad Geiger said, at you. 
Dave, that was an old Dangerfield bit. <laughs> yeah, it's like when I come home from shopping and my wife says, yeah, you call these tomatoes? How come you bought these tomatoes? I said, they looked like good tomatoes. She said, how come nobody else bought those tomatoes? You go over to Lou. You go down to the produce section. Ask for Lou. He'll give you tomatoes. <laughs> you know what's funny? I know this is a, now a joke, but there was one time where uh, there there is a wonderful uh, Japanese market, but it's just far enough away from me in Los Angeles where I'm like, nah, I don't want to drive all the way over there just to get really good uh, Japanese cut beef, right? Um, yeah. So I went to my local, uh, uh, you know, supermarket and I said, hey, can you cut this this steak Japanese style with that really thin, <laughs> you know, so I can, I can do like a, a sukiyaki or something? And... Yeah. And he goes, <laughs> he literally goes, yes, I can absolutely do that for you. And anytime you're here, you ask for me and I'll get this cut for you. And I was like, all right, don't make it creepy. You ask for me. All right. Thanks, Gary. Whatever this is. I don't know what, what a relationship are we building here, Gary? You ask for me, Gary, the butcher, and I'll do me. this cut for you. What are you on <laughs> commission with the steak? What's happening? <laughs> Well, you know, but on the other hand, it's nice to see somebody who takes pride in their work. Right. Like, too, I you think know? he was saying these other jokers don't know how to do a Japanese yeah. style. Yes, I know yeah. how to cut this. Yeah, you asked for Gary, but it made it creepy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you asked for me. I'm Gary. I'll cut that piece. Come beef right for over you. here and stand next to me. Yeah. I'll make sure it's done just the way you like it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it, it's not that hard to set up uh, uh, to check and get that right on your site. It's, it's, like I said, it's tailor made. Even if your site, you know, if you, even though you don't have all the bells and whistles. The important thing is you get it up, then you've got an archive and all that kind of stuff. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's easier than you think. Yeah. And uh, Daryl, on a side note, uh, congratulations on the impending fatherhood. That's fantastic. Yeah. And Brad, do you want to share with him the, the advice that you shared with me? Uh, about fatherhood? Yeah. Uh, what Don't you remember what you told me before we had our first? Uh, what did I tell you? I, he, I, you gave me a great, well, I'll share it because you're, you're getting a little bit forgetful in your old age, I'm, I'm but blank, yeah. <laughs> doddering around the house in slippers. Uh, what, what Brad told me, and I think this was great. He goes, listen, if this is a partnership and yeah. you've got to be there. And the way you can be there is you can't help with the breastfeeding. There's nothing you can do on that front. So you're going right. to be responsible for everything that comes out. If you take yep. on every diaper change, then you are being an active partner in raising that child. And I was like, you know what? Yes, that's a great idea. And so I did for years on yep. end. I was like, I will take care of it. That's on me. That's my job. <laughs> and uh, it was I thought it was great advice. Because this bullshit 1950s-ism of like, oh, the missus will take care of it. I'm not I'm right. not involved in any of that. No, you jerk. Right. Go help, you know? Yep. No, that was, I was passionate about, I'm like, no, I, if you're, and breastfeeding, especially breastfeeding, although any, listen, any kind of child care when they're infants is tough, but, you know, breastfeeding really does take uh, an extra level of, uh, you know, stick to it and, uh, and it's tough. And I'm like, gee, and, but the health rewards are amazing. So I'm like, if you're going to do that, I've got every diaper change. No questions asked. You shouldn't have to do both. If you if you want to hear something really nice, Dave, and I'm going to pat both of us on the back. Do you remember when we had Chris Straub on uh, uh, on an episode of Web Comics Weekly and we talked him through fatherhood? As oh, he I remember he was very first? stressed. I, yeah. yeah. Uh, and in a way that was endearing, he was like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to do fatherhood. <laughs> <laughs> If you go uh, to Web but, Comics Weekly, it's not behind the paywall. You can go to the Web Comics. Uh, if you go to webcomics.com, there's a Web Comics Weekly uh, section, and you can hear that. But what did we actually say to him? Do you remember? Oh, we 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 did an entire hour worth of advice where we said a lot. You know, a lot of stuff, Dave, that you and I have told like young fathers at conventions and stuff for, for a long time. Stuff like everybody right now is telling you your life is over. Those people are assholes <laughs> and don't listen to them. You yeah. think your fun in, in a very real sense is just beginning. Yeah. This is going to be fantastic. Yes. There's going to be some things that you can't do anymore. There's some things you're going to do differently, but mainly you're going to live your, your same life. Only you're going to have a little person there that you're going to get to enjoy all of this stuff with. And that makes it absolutely fantastic. You're going to, you're, uh, it, Dave, do you remember a time before you had kids? 
I mean, uh, yeah, but I, I knew uh, what I was going to say is this in, in, in welcoming kids in your life too. you've also tripled your writing capacity in terms of just oh, idea generation. Yeah. It's, you're looking, you're literally looking at the world with new eyes in a way that is helpful as a writer. You know, you're, you're looking yeah. at things with fresh through fresh vantages and you're like, Oh, right. Yeah. That's a joke possibility there. Oh, that's a storyline yep. possibility there. Um, so, uh, I've, I've found it in the long run helpful to my cartooning in a way that no one ever talked about when I, when, and the jerks are like, oh, your life is over. Oh, you can't do this and that. You know, I don't yeah. know why we keep yeah. going back to that voice today, but uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's the same guy. You asked for Brian. You tell him Brad Geiger said you. Also, your life is over as a new parent. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. Uh, you, this is, it's it's a fantastic time. You're in for a thrill. Uh, and, and and by the way, don't let those people let you take your eyes off the focus. And, and, and by the way, I'm going to bring this full circle. Having okay. a kid means that even more than ever, you shouldn't be worried about schedules. You're on a different schedule now, especially when they're infants. You're on a different yeah. schedule. Oh, yeah. Don't let this comic drain your joy thinking, I got to get this out on Thursday. Uh, you know, if, if the kid needs a little extra tension and that comic comes out uh, next Monday, so be it. You're going to be just fine. Right. Right. Yeah. And and uh, to Brad's big thing about careers, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And that, yes. the, the love and affection and care that you give your kids is far more important in that moment than generating a comic. And it's OK if it comes out a week from now, a month from now, whenever uh, that that takes priority. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. Okay, Bradley J. Well, our next question comes in from Curious Borg over at patreon.com slash comic lab. Uh, of all the Borgs, it's nice to have a Curious Borg. You don't want an incurious <laughs> Borg. Uh, no, no, that's a very dull Borg. I think uh, Lacutus of Borg. Uh, by the way, why did he get a name? All the other Borgs have a number. He gets Lacutus. I never understood yeah, that. It was, it was a little bit of uh, Borg favoritism. Also, I I felt like he he threw a little French flair in there. Like, did you know? We get it. You're Picard, even though you have an English accent. But Lacutus doesn't that sound like a wine in Southern France? Like, oh yeah, it sounds like the cutest in uh, in French. Lacutus. <laughs> French for the cutest. His ego couldn't help, but he's like, I'm the cutest Borg. All right. Anyway. Um, now that's a comic I would read. The cutest Borg. <laughs> the cutest Borg. Uh, all right. Here's the question from Curious Borg. Hi, da Drad and Babe. Well, that's a different one. Ooh. Drad and Babe. Boy, people are trying to throw me up now. Okay. Uh, throw me up. Throw me off. Uh, just to mix things up a bit. Could you put aside the comics and do a segment on podcasting? You're professional podcasters, too, and among the most Funnest podcast. I always like when someone says more, most, more, most funnest. Uh, what have you yeah. learned about methods, equipment, software, and uploading that is different when you started back in the web comics weekly days? Oh, good lord! Mm. Singing the praises of people behind the scenes, please, who would now help with the editing and the music as well. All right, Bradley yeah. J. So it has been probably twelve years since we started podcasting back in the day yeah. with Web Comics I Weekly. Think, I'm guessing. I think Web Comics Weekly started around 06 or 07. Oh, did it? Oh, that's far than yeah. I thought back. Okay, geez Louise. Yeah. So back in the day, uh, the cloud did not exist. Um, no. Syncing up different audio from different remote locations was a bear. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing was custom built in the way that it is now for, you know, uh, small shop podcasting. Um, yep. But what else do you remember from those first days? Well, back in the day, we used to do this on Google Meet and we all recorded at the same time. Everything recorded in one recording uh, so if somebody was out of sync or if something happened to somebody who's uh, individual computer, like happened on the laugh track episode, uh, it could have some pretty significant uh, effects right. on the end result. Whereas when Dave and I record right now using Squadcast, 
uh, my track is being recorded on my computer with no lag. His mm-hmm. track is being computed on his uh, computer with no lag. And then we send that uh, off to be synced up. Uh, and and we uh, have a have a very professional sounding show. Yeah, and and thank God we have at least one good voice. Brad's on the podcast because mine is a train wreck. So no, but uh, I remember too that we would have back in the day. Uh, to answer your question, Curious Borg, we would have yeah. entire hour or hour and a half shows that we would have to throw out because the audio yeah. of one or oh, two yeah. files was either corrupted or was no good or the signal was bad. It was not a great way to do podcasts back in the day. Um, but now there are entire uh, platforms set up. We have tried things like Simplecast. We're currently mm-hmm. on a, a podcasting uh, system called Squadcast, which mm-hmm. Brad and I can watch a real-time video of one another, he in Philadelphia, I in Los Angeles. Um, and it is probably a half-second lag, don't you think, Brad? It's pretty much real-time. Uh, yeah. And in the meantime, while we are speaking to one another, our audio, to Brad's point, is being recorded locally and then being backed up to the cloud uh, on Dropbox automatically. So yeah. uh, I-, I cannot tell you how much that automation makes a world of difference. It used to all have to be by <laughs> hand. Everyone yeah. would forget one step of the process uh, back in the day. It was terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, the quality of of, of pro am and and uh, uh, amateur mics has gotten worlds better since it uh, back then in terms of yeah. what was available as a USB plug-in, don't you think, Brad? Absolutely. And one of the things that also helped us do a lot better that we didn't have wasn't a thing at all. It was a person, uh, Matt Woodard, who uh, oh we God. brought yes. on as the audio uh, editor, and he's he's made this show sound way better than it should have. Oh, yeah. For uh, for all the moments that it sounds great, there were 10 or 20 where Brad and I seriously messed up on something. And, yeah. you know, uh, we're getting better as we go. But especially in the early years of the show, Matt was salvific in, in taking chopped audio or bad audio or stilted audio and making mm-hmm. it sound great. And honestly, that was part of our process coming out of Web Comics Weekly is the recognition that there were certain shows that would have just sat in the can if we didn't have yeah. an editor. We have enough projects yeah. where, or and enough schedules uh, and deadlines where we're like, I don't have time to edit it, Brad. Do you have time to edit it? No. <laughs> and so we realized in our early conversation with uh, Comic Lab that, look, we have to hire an editor um, yeah. and someone who knows what they're doing and who would find fun and joy in it aside from, from how we would f- find fun and joy in it. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, Matt has been a godsend in terms of what he's been able to bring to the show. And then for the music, uh, we used uh, my dear friend, Andy Creighton, um, who uh, is at the World Record, um, and he's over at uh, um, theworldrecord.net. He has been a dear friend in Los Angeles for uh, decades now and also did a lot of the music for my documentary, Stripped. Um, mm-hmm. As you know, Brad, um, in in getting music for the movie, you have to go to the artist and say, yeah, no, we need it worldwide. Yeah, we need it yeah. for broadcast and for streaming. Yeah, and we also yeah. need it for uh, DVD sales. And so the checks would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And Andy, <laughs> being an independent artist himself, A, he's an, he's an incredible polymath with a bunch of different instruments. He's amazing. Um, and then we could say, no, we want a specific Django Fett here, but Django Fett as though it were run through a uh, European house electronica filter. And he'd be like, on it, right? And you could <laughs> he, he, you could ask for anything and he would make it. Anyway, uh, Andy did the music for, um, for this show, which I love. It's such an energetic, fun, uh, joy-filled yeah. uh, intro to this show every week. Um, and Brad, just in terms of logistics, we're on uh, we're in studios on opposite sides of the country. Your studio in Philadelphia, yep. as I said, mine in Los Angeles. Um, we both have created a time every week where it is fixed. We do not change the time. It's always Tuesdays yeah. at eight thirty for me, uh, eleven thirty for 11:30 Brad. Eleven thirty for me. And, yep. and in a way that makes it helpful, you don't even have to think about it because the scheduling. Basically, we have learned over the decades that if you remove any roadblocks that could make someone say, "Can't do it this week," oh, can we try this time? You just say, "No, this yeah. is the time," and then yeah. we send the file to Matt as soon as we can right afterward, and then it's done. You know, to mm-hmm. to minimize the impact it has on our week. And honestly, one of the things that's powered me, Brad, I can't speak for you, but one of the things that's powered me through making this show for four years now is that I legitimately love talking comics with you. A, yeah. it's fun to talk comics. Uh, B, like at the beginning of this show, you give me a better insight than I had when I went into it for the week. And then I laugh so much with you. You make me laugh yeah. about making comics. And I, I love someone who shares that joy for comics. 
It is it is a, a joyful uh, hour. I, I, we we we've said this before. We would do this even if the microphones weren't on. And we do <laughs> we, kind of in a way, we, yeah. We, <laughs> yeah. But the one thing you know, I, Dave, you pointed this out to me, and it's really opened my eyes. Axios did a story about the 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 booming podcast industry, and yes. you know how there, there's so many podcasts, and and it's so fascinating what's happening to podcasts mirrors so uh, so closely what happened in the early 2000s in web comics we saw we're seeing a lot of that they're all trying to uh, join uh, 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 like aggregators or or platforms or syndicates right. a bunch of people are joining on spotify a bunch of people are doing this a bunch of people are doing that they're trying to form these groups just like we did in the early 2000s with Keen Spot and Modern Tales. There's a lot of experimentation and, uh, with format and with genre and with what yeah. in the same way that we did with web comics in the early 2000s, you know. But when they they had a they had a chart there that broke down, you know, in terms of per episode download, we are in the top 20% of podcasters in terms of our per episode download and that absolutely was jaw dropping to me. I did not expect that to be the case that we'd be in the top 20%. Honest to God, yeah. I thought maybe top 70 or 80%. I uh, yeah. the exact opposite mathematically from where we ended up. So, uh that was fun to see. And then it's also fun to see, I think Brad, I told you about this that when I went to a it was not a podcaster's convention, but it was I think it was a um a Patreon convention, but a lot of podcasters happened to be there. And yeah. I started talking about how we did Comic Lab versus how the average podcasters in the room did. And some of these people from much bigger shows was like, wait, how, you're, you're doing what with it? Well, how are you doing this? Why, why are you doing it this way? <laughs> because so much of the, the, the tried and true, quote unquote, podcast method now is... Yeah. Get get picked up by some bigger group like a Wondery or something like that, right? Yep. And yep. then have a huge push for your first episode because if the first episode goes and you get you get keyed in by the alg algorithms on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all that sort of stuff, then mm -hmm. you have a chance in the industry. But if you don't have a big splash, you kind of quietly disappear. Uh, yeah. There's there's very little with the big ones. There's very little slow and grow technique, which is what we use and advocate. Like keep it small, keep it controllable, make in fact, yep. controllable is the big part with us, as it is with our web comics. Own and control your own career. Don't bring in another yeah. company, because what what's worthwhile for Brad and I in terms of income, in terms of time spent, and all that sort of stuff is not what it is worth for a big aggregate. You know, right. it, the, what this show could and will make is not worth it for a Wondery, but. By controlling it ourselves, we actually uh, eventually get to a bigger income, a more satisfying income, a more satisfying audience experience, I think, uh, than you would by going with the big boys, which is a lot like web comics and and middle size comics producers, I would say, you know. And that's something that we found out talking to uh, there was a po it was from one of the podcast companies that you and I were both talking to. And when we told him about how we handled the business end of this podcast through Patreon and and so forth. Uh, he was like, you guys are like 10 years ahead of other uh, of podcasting in general, uh, because podcasting is still in advertising. And remember, he told us they're oh, developing right. a software uh, or there already is a software that users can strip out advertising, which is exactly the same as exactly <laughs> what, what we've happened to already comics. experienced. Yep. We've already solved all that. We went straight to crowdfunding. We went straight to stuff like that where, where we can directly control it. We never uh, did advertising advertising at all. And except for sponsorships, which was, of course, a, a direct relationship didn't do any of that stuff and we've <laughs> i guarantee you we're doing we've got a much better uh a success uh in terms of our podcasting than a lot of people who are still struggling with those ads yeah and i remember in that conversation with that podcaster and we won't reveal who it was but they were established podcaster they were saying oh well the rest of the industry is all focused on algorithmically inserted and algorithmically <laughs> removed advertising <laughs> Yes. Where the computer finds some weird moment, and he said, you know, sometimes it'll be in the middle of a sentence almost, or sometimes it'll be in the middle of a thought, or uh, yeah. the the ad is very jarring in its levels because it's algorithmically inserted. Mm -hmm. And so he goes, boy, you guys are doing it totally different. How did you come across this way? And we're like, well, we've been working online for 20 years, and we, we yeah. did it the way we did it with webcomics. It just seemed like the better way to do it. Um, 
where you own and control and have direct contact with your with your audience and in in the case of sponsorships with your sponsors um yeah so uh that seemed like the better way to go and honestly uh i like the way we do it it makes me happy i'd yeah. rather have this awesome community on patreon.com slash comic lab and the discord server that's associated with it it's oh. fun i learn things it's a great sharing community uh and i wouldn't want to go the other route where uh some computer or like a Wondery is inserting ads that I, you know, I don't, no one needs to know about pillows on Comic Lab or, or. <laughs> Certainly or what, not. You know, it's always, it always seems to be foam mattresses and pillows and I don't know what, yeah. what else is the inserted ad on podcast. But um, I like it. And I, I, what's great <laughs> I'll is. I'll tell you the truth. I don't know. And I'll tell you why. Because like we talked about an earlier show, I only listen to one podcast. When the ad comes up, I, that phone comes out and I fast forward through. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to listen to this. Zoop, zoop, zoop. I have uh, the, the, the show I listen to is ad supported. I haven't, I, I couldn't tell you which ads run on that show. Cause yeah. I don't listen and to I, that. uh, for me, the, the, having our support through Patreon is nice because it is all the advantages of distributed fundraising in the sense that uh, yeah. one person yeah. loses their job, one person decides to, to ditch out. It's not the end of the world. It's not like if your advertising network suddenly abandons you uh, or your numbers didn't do great on Apple Podcasts that week, so you can't mm. make your, your the show's you know expenditure. Uh, and so with distributed fundraising, it's such an advantage for, for small to medium-sized artists to build a wonderful career that you can own and control. And so I think using and applying the webcomics model onto podcasting has been really lovely. Absolutely. Well, as long as we're going to come back to webcomics, we're going to have another question about it. I'm going to bring us back to a question from Alexi. And uh, this is a great one, Dave. You're going to love it. <laughs> I've got a lot of these. I don't know if you've got any. Uh, what are your pet peeves when it comes to things that creators do in comics? So uh, the, the one that, that Alexi uh, uh, says that, that, that he's got, for example, I couldn't watch the show Sleepy Hollow because the main character always wore the same clothes in every episode. So I can imagine Fred Flintstone gave this guy shakes, but... <laughs> what, what are what are your do you have any do you have any like these uh, when i think pet peeves i think like little things that annoy you uh, despite the fact that they're just minor things well you know it's funny one of my pet peeves we actually talked about a few weeks back which is when the line width of a border <sighs> or a word balloon is mm -hmm. markedly different than the yeah. lettering or the uh the character line art um, there are some people that use like Sharpie, like the middle sized Sharpie for their uh, border in terms of uh, yeah. line width. And then their character is done with a 0 0.005 micron. And you're like, well, this is a very different. You know what I mean? It just has amateur written on it when the line qualities yeah. don't uh, don't work with one another. How about you? What's a, what, uh, yeah. This is kind of fun to think through a couple uh, different. The first one that came to mind. And I'm t I'm, I'm telling I'm going to I'm going to preface this. If I say this and I'm talking about you at home. I want you to know I'm laughing more at me than I'm laughing at you. Cause this is sure. a really silly thing to get wound up about. Every time I see somebody who combines their name with the, uh, uh, the word tunes, like Jeff oh. tunes, Jerry tunes, Susie tunes. <laughs> Every time I see somebody's name and then tunes combined, Bob tunes, Fred tunes, I, it, it, I get, I, I cringe. Uh, there's something about it. It's, it makes me crazy. I, <laughs> and I don't know why I do not know why, but it, it just, I, I, it, it drives me up the wall. That is one I would not have thought of until you said it, but you're right. It has kind of a feeling of like the 1970s, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't know why that branding feels like seventies to me, like Brad tunes, Dave tunes. Yeah, I, it, maybe that's why it, it just feels kind of old and tired and uncreative because it's, it's yeah. like that's been done so much you know, and it's not good branding. You know what it kind of feels like? And tell me if tell me if it gives you this mood. You're at yeah. Magic Mountain or you're at, at Disneyland <laughs> and you walk yeah. by a caricature and it says Brad Tunes and you're like, that's what that feels like to me. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. That same kind of feeling of a poorly marketed caricaturist at, a, at an amusement park. That's what yeah. that feels like. 
Like yeah. just take a, take a minute, do a little brainstorming on a better name you could use to advertise yourself. Uh, and so, yeah, okay, I I respect that that uh, that pet peeve. All right, so I'll go with another one. And by the way, these are all just pet peeves. They they're they're not. We're not speaking about or making fun of you specifically. They're they're more of a yes. comment on it says us. More about us. this is more about us. <laughs> than... yes. We're laughing at us. Uh, I one of the things that's an interesting pet peeve is uh, when um, and because it, it, it happens to all of us, but it's hard not to to shake it when you when you see it is when all of the characters have the same face shape. Um, oh, yeah. A, a lot of it is with first year or second year comics. And that's okay. That's why I'm saying I, I'm not taking this as a shot, but it's an interesting pet peeve because some people keep it into year 20 of their comic. And you're like, really? Yeah. All yeah. right. I, I guess we're doing this. Like, uh, so, it, <laughs> you know, people come in all shapes and sizes and it's it's worth expressing that in the comic and experimenting. But sometimes when people first lock down a shape, it's like, finally, I got a face shape that works for my style. I like this. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Everybody's getting it. Susan, you're having the same <laughs> face shape as Greg and the dog that walked in. He has the same face shape too we're all getting the same face shape <laughs> and greg you got the same face shape as trevor tunes everybody's got the same face shape that's right that's right uh, i've got i've got another one and it in it and it dovetails with an earlier topic and i see this all the time on social media drives me up the wall when you take the time to announce that you didn't do a comic today Oh, well, yeah. I, I, yeah, sorry, yeah. everybody. No comic today. I stubbed my toe and I'm telling you, I'm limping like a son of a gun. Uh, the dumbest thing you could do again, think of that smorgasbord. The dumbest thing you can do is call attention to something that's not there. I'm telling you, they didn't notice it wasn't there until you pointed it out. <laughs> Don't right. do th that's that's a huge pet peeve of mine. I'm sitting there screaming at Twitter saying, dummy, just just just. Put your head down, work on the comic, and then tomorrow, instead of saying, I didn't have a comic yesterday, say, hey, guess what? I've got a comic today. Right. Right. It's in a way, it's kind of like a business. Have you ever gotten this, Brad, when you got an email from a company that you weren't currently doing business with, but you have in the past yeah. and you will in the future? Yeah. But somehow you're on their email list and they're like, we are so sorry that X, Y, Z happened. <laughs> My immediate marketing <laughs> response is like, why are you market blasting or email blasting everybody? Like, right. this is just email the people wanna... that complained. Uh, yeah. You know, like, why? I don't need to know that your your warehouse caught fire. Like, uh, you know, if, 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 and if anything, it just gives a bad look to the people that were not complaining about this. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so it's interesting. We're like, hey, no comic today. You're like, oh, well, what's going wrong? Why? why? <laughs> like these are remember that these are people coming to you for entertainment. They don't necessarily need to know when the entertainment <sighs> is not there. Just provide the entertainment the next time you can, I think, is a, is a good way. Uh, yeah. To say and, it. and there's also an ego part there, because what you're doing is in your mind, you you're you're imagining all of these readers saying, where's Brad today? Where's Brad? Brad's got to be out there somewhere. How come there's no comic from Brad? I, I can tell you that no one has ever spent a moment saying to themselves, where's Brad Geiger today? Uh, they've got better things to think about. They really yeah. do. They really yeah. do. Uh, they're happy when I come to them tomorrow and say, here I am. But yeah. nobody goes through, they're driving through traffic on I-95, so slows down and says, wait a minute, where's Brad Geiger? Nobody's thinking about me. <laughs> they're not thinking about you either. Right. Well, I'll jump in with another pet peeve. And this one more has more to do with writing, is that uh, – I'm always a little bit put off when, and again, I know that I'm a little Pollyanna-ish, but uh, yeah. when someone uses a curse word in lieu of good writing, mm. do you know what I mean by that? In their mm -hmm, writing, mm -hmm. when they when they go to either shock therapy or offensiveness yeah. rather than yeah. coming up with a clever comeback or rather than coming up with a clever punchline, right. it is it is cuss word, cuss word, cuss word. Hey, right. That's funny, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, OK, yes, I'm not I'm not so naive that I don't see that the, there's a value in like a good, a well-placed cuss word. But when a writer consistently goes to that or it's like, nah, couldn't you have taken an extra second and write, written a truly unique punchline for that? That would have been better, mm -hmm. you know? Mm hmm. I'll tell you, I've got one more that I'll throw out there, and that is lazy cut and paste. And I'll tell you what I mean. Uh, I, I'm an advocate, actually, of cut and paste. In other words, I don't think you should draw anything that you've already drawn. <laughs> okay, especially a background, especially a background. 
But it, it is possible to get too lazy with your cut and paste. In other words, a lot of times, if I cut and paste a foreground character, I'll make that cut and paste, uh, uh, I'll put it into the sketch layer, and I'll, I'll, I'll add some stuff or add a, 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 a position. I'll think about the scene and wonder about how that body would have moved to react in that scene. I saw it just today, and, and it drove me crazy. It was a three-panel comic. Uh, and the and the scene was just a cut and paste of a guy sitting in front of his computer, except in the in the middle panel, the second panel, somebody was shouting something shocking uh, from off panel. It was like a really surprising uh, 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 shout that was being said. It was it was a shocking, and he, his position didn't change. And the comic, as a result, had no emotion. It was flat. It was it was it had no energy. That uh, that sentence that was shouted off panel should have rocked him in his chair. He should have had a pen flying out of his hands. His eyes should have been spinning around in his head. His shoulders and his so arms should have been a up. Nineteen forties Warner Brothers comic. All right, <laughs> yes. But I'm saying I, I I get it. I get I I get the uh, urge and sometimes the need to cut and paste. But don't get so lazy with your cut and paste that you forget that you're actually trying to describe a scene there. And if the, if the emotion changes in that uh, panel, the illustration has to change. Yeah. You know, what's an interesting counterpoint to someone asking us, by the way, about our pet peeves is that, yeah. and I think this is worth talking about for, as a closer to this idea mm -hmm. is that you and I think would both admit that no matter what our pet peeves are, if someone does a comic, well, then shine us. Like if, if it works, yeah. I don't care if it hits my pet peeves. If a comic yep. is well done, oh, yeah. then, then to heck with me, that's great. It was a great comic. So yep. every time I see one on Reddit or on, on uh, Instagram or on uh, something where I wasn't actively seeking out a comic, but it's being shared and I'm like, Oh wow, I don't like yeah. the lettering on this, but this is a solid idea or this is really well executed for the level skill level that they clearly have. Then mm -hmm. kudos to them, you know? Uh, yep. So what I'm saying is if, if you're listening to our stupid pet peeves and frankly, who yeah. cares about our pet peeves. But if you're listening to ours and feeling disheartened, don't be. Um, the world still rewards great ideas executed as well as you can execute them, no matter what level you're at, is what I'm getting at, right? Yep. Yep. And if you're doing a fantastic comic and you're branding it as Stan Tunes, uh, <laughs> go go for it. Because remember, what the, the, the cardinal rule here at Comic Lab is do a good comic. If you do a good comic, you can call it whatever you want to call it. You can all call it Uncle Manny's Funhouse, and it's going to be a good comic. Uh, by the way, don't call it Uncle Manny's Funhouse. That sounds creepy. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to not call it Uncle Manny's Funhouse. All right, Brad, I've got one last question for you from patreon.com slash comic lab. This comes in from Rachel McAlpin. And yeah. Rachel writes, Dear Brad and Dave, love the show. Thank you for making it, especially during this pandemic. Thank you, Rachel. That is awesome. Yeah, that continues to mean a lot to us when anybody uh, finds value in the pandemic in the show. Uh, my question is about studio space outside mm. the home. How do you find a space to rent? I've tried looking for office space for rent and similar searches, but come up with astronomical rents. If you have any tips to share, I would appreciate it. Thank you both, Rachel. Um, so yeah. Brad, uh, Rachel has a great question and it's an interesting time to have this question because we're starting mm. to see the light maybe at the end of the tunnel in the next six to nine months if we can get mm -hmm. uh, herd immunity through vaccination. So yeah. office space might uh, come back from its cratering in a lot of big cities and and uh, and commercial real estate might get more of a, a market going. But what are your thoughts, Brad? How does Rachel look for a space? Well, your first step is just to start talking to the people around you. The way I found this studio, which turned out to be a godsend, uh, I was I was taking my kids to school uh, and driving them about 20 minutes, uh, half an hour one way, and then fighting my way back into the city and then working from home and then fighting my way back out to pick them up from school at 2.30 and then fighting my way back into the city. It was taking uh, easily two and a half hours out of my day every day. So right. the first thing I did was I started to talk to the other parents on the playground. And I said, yeah, I really would love to find some, some studio space in this neighborhood so I could just bring the kids to school, drop mm -hmm. them off. I'd be right here. I could work and then pick them up and go home. I, I, and I'm like, at that point, I was like, I'll even rent a room from somebody. You know, I don't care. I just need a place to, I, at that point, to just set up to a shop, set up. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, 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 a table, a chair, and a light, and a, an electric outlet, and I'd be great. Maybe a fridge, a stocked bar, you know, some snack. No, all, all right, right, but I'm like, I'll, there, I'll take, I'll take anything. And that's really how I found this place because uh, one of the other parents pointed me to somebody uh, that uh, it just so happened to have a space uh, open right in the neighborhood to the extent that like for years when my kids had were sick or had a snow day, I was uh, five minutes away. I just jumped in and I was there, you know, right. before, before anything could happen. So that's your first step is start just asking the people around you. Mm -hmm, uh, what do mm -hmm. you think step number two could be, Dave? Well, step number two, I think, is uh, ask yourself what you need. Like to Brad's point, yeah. he just needed a room. Uh, if uh, And I think, Brad, with your current studio space, it's sort of like a lot of, say, shared dentist office where the bathroom is sort of down the hall, right? Yep, you, that's you sort exactly of shared... right. Uh, you can also ask yourself, Rachel, if, if a little kitchenette or a bathroom is important to you. For some people, that would mm -hmm. be like a stupid thing. And for other people, that's a key consideration. If, right. if uh, privacy or diet is of concern. Um, I think safety is a big issue because a lot of artist studios yeah. that I, at least in Los Angeles, um, have tended to be in downtown LA, which is admittedly a burgeoning area from a former industrial setting. But like the lights go down in downtown LA in some neighborhoods and you're like, oh boy, I am going to be murdered. And yeah. um, and so that's a consideration. So sometimes you're, you're literally paying for safety uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to artist studio rents. Uh, like Brad, I think there's, there is some possibilities for room rental. Um, a lot of, at least in my neighborhood of LA, there's a lot of older retirees that, the kids are gone or they had a bonus room out back behind the garage or something. And yeah. there's a fair amount of non-commercial real estate that you might consider uh, in your neighborhood, depending on where you are, Rachel, and what your setup is. I, I can't mm -hmm. speak to every city, but L.A. is a little bit more suburban -y feeling than your average city, although certain Texas cities and Arizona feeling cities are like L.A., but you get what I'm going at. If you're in yeah. Chicago, New York, Philly, uh, Toronto, it's less suburban -y feeling. And so there's less like, quote unquote, rooms out back kind of a feeling. Yeah. Um, although, Brad, maybe you can speak to that about Philadelphia. I don't know. Are there well, are there rooms out back, so to speak, in Philadelphia? Not so much, although like in my neighborhood, uh, it, it's all row houses, which means it's all connected houses. But when they were building the neighborhood, every house on the corner at the end of the block had like a store built into the basement. So they they didn't have a big basement, but they had a store oh, that, that was really? like <laughs> built That's clever. So, oh, it's so cool. In they fact, sort of tried uh, to build a small community in that little row yes, house area. That's yes. neat. And every house had a store uh, at the end of the block. Uh, so you'd have, you know, any number of things. When we first moved in, there was a little convenience store run by a family that was at the end of our block. So, oh, so can many I be times, sad for a minute? Did it go out of business? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was, that, it, it's been out of heart. business for a long time. But, and what is it but, now? Man, uh, at, at somebody's basement. In fact, I've oh. gone through and knocked on doors at saying, if you ever want to rent that out again, let me know because <laughs> I'd love to have a studio at the end of the block, you know? Right. Uh, right. But, uh, but, but for so many years, I like every, so many times it was somebody's birthday and my wife would say, did you get the birthday candles? And I'd say, of course I got the birthday candles. Hold on a minute. And I'd go running down the street and it was like one of these little places, a mom and shop place. And he had everything. If I walked in and said, do you have birthday candles? He'd shove aside, uh, you know, playing cards and, <laughs> you know, uh, 10, 40, uh, 10 WD 40 and find the, the birthday candles. Right. Right. So, so yeah, there is that. Now there's one thing I do want to tell you about, and that is obviously check out places like Craigslist where yes. you're going to find a lot of rentals. And when you do, uh, you can fine tune your search to your price range and how many miles within a certain zip code, all that kind of stuff. But here's something I want to put on your radar. There's something that's becoming very, very popular these days, and it's called WorkShare. Are you familiar with WorkShare, Dave? Yeah. And so uh, I can speak to this for a minute, actually, Brad. So uh, there's there's things like WeWork and that kind of stuff where it is a it's a, they try to make it very hipstery by throwing a lot of venture capital towards making a space look like it's a software company. Right. So there's a coffee bar and there's a, yep. a oh, an atrium and oh, but then each one of the side offices, which are eight feet by eight feet, cost you four thousand a month. And you're like, why is anyone doing this? That's right. my attitude with WeWork is that it's like yes. it's very expensive to get anything other than one of the shared tables in the center atrium for 
or anything at a reasonable price. Uh, and so I I personally don't put a lot of stock into the sort of shared workspaces, although I know Keith Knight, who we've had on the show, Keith tried to convince me that shared workspace was a good idea. It worked for him for a brief period. Yeah. So, you know, your, your mileage may vary uh, on that. If you've got the right personality, work share could work for you. It would never work for me because there's too many things that would drive me crazy. You're not in the same place every time. Every time you walk into the, the place, you're you know, just wherever there's an open spot. That right. would make me nuts. And right. the other thing, there's other people. And as you know, me and other people don't get along. There'd be other people being people, and that would drive me up the wall. Uh, but there are some people who enjoy being social. There's some people who, uh, without being silly about it, need that interaction. They're, they're extroverts. They, they thrive on that. If that's you, maybe work share is a good option. Yeah, and along those lines, Rachel, one thing I would, I would uh, suggest is there is sometimes value both in terms of security and in terms of decision making and in terms of monthly rent in joining mm -hmm. up with two or three other artists, you know, in your yeah. area or your community and saying, hey, you guys want to get a studio together or seeking out in through the sort of network of artist friends you have in your community. Hey, does anyone know if someone is looking for a new member of their studio? And yeah. uh, so we both, Brad and I, have had artist friends who have joined up with painters or sculptors or yep. graphic designers. And instead of paying, uh, you know, uh, 2000 a month, they pay 900 because they split it with four people and everybody has a key. Mm -hmm. and now, granted, the opposite of security is also true because those people are always bringing their friends into the studio. And so you've mm -hmm. got to be able to have a network of trust with these people that your space, your shared space, uh, has both the privacy and the security that you need, while at the same time giving you the savings you want. Um, another Another thing that I would suggest is you can go to a commercial real estate agent, Rachel, and and ask around about what their rates would be, because sometimes, if I'm not mistaken, uh, last year, right before the pandemic, my wife started to look for commercial real estate. And I think and I don't quote me on this, but I think sometimes commercial real estate agents will be paid by the rentor, the, the, the owner, as for sort of a finder's fee for finding them a client. I think that's the case. I don't remember, Rachel, if that was the case or not. In any case, it, it turned out to be way more money than, than Gloria and I wanted to spend for her <laughs> office, and we backed away quickly. Um, and then it turned out great because she didn't sign a lease right before the pandemic. So that was Smart. good. That worked out yeah. well. Um, but then I will say this one last thing, Rachel, is that I, knowing very little about commercial real estate, have the sense that we are at the edge of a groundbreaking time in commercial real estate um, that has happened uh, probably never before, where post-pandemic, you already had in some uh, industries way overbuilt and built out uh, real estate uh, listings. And now there's less companies clamoring for them and less clients clamoring for them, both because people have learned that they can work from home or work remotely. And also a lot of businesses just failed. So if you're going to do this, Rachel, this is a great time to negotiate your price down because I think a lot of owners are going to be like, yeah, fine, a client. I'm happy to have anybody. Sure, you can pay 20% less. That's fine. Oh, God, you're breathing. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. And, and, if, and if you're a good renter, they'll be happy to see you come in the door. And you, like Dave points out you could absolutely negotiate a better spot because it's going to be it's going to be a buyer's market for for a little while in this particular case yeah and i think in especially especially in certain kind of industries and in certain kind of real estate it might be a buyer's market for a long while because some companies just might decide now nah, we're not going back into the office you know or we're not yeah. going or you know what we, we don't have a choice we don't exist anymore so we don't need real estate <laughs> um, so anyway rachel i hope that's helpful to you i and also i think it is worth mentioning that um both brad and i have had space outside the house and inside mm -hmm. the house and mm -hmm. there are advantages and disadvantages to both um, so as you explore studio space, know that you are giving up certain things in living at home, which is like the ability of, oh, everyone went to bed, but I have a burst of energy. So I'm yeah. going to pad down the hall to my little studio and, and work until 1am. Uh, mm -hmm. can't do that if you have a studio space set out, uh, you know, away from the house. The opposite is also true. Uh, if you're trying to work in the house and there's a bunch of noise and you just want a couple hours, God, it's nice to have a studio to go to. So, yeah. uh, both have their upsides and both have their downsides. Well, I tell you what, I, I'll tell you one upside. The upside of this is that you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my friend, the king of upsides, Brad Geiger, the <laughs> editor of webcomics.com <laughs> and the creator of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And my good friend, No Downsides, Dave Kellett, co-director of Strip. 
and the cartoonist of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. And there are some downsides, but my doctor says that's just aging. The Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode like this one. Uh, this one came in from, uh, <laughs> the, it, the headline is Let's Talk Comics, uh, and, and it came in from somebody whose uh, username, uh, follow this here, Dave, it's uh, T-E-K-I-L-A, and then the word penguin. Now, what would you make for that? I would make me going, penguin is how <laughs> that, I would pronounce that's, that. That's either tequila penguin or tequila penguin. And it, both of those, <laughs> those, both of those have a little splaining to do. Right. <laughs> so we'll assume that it's uh, tequila penguin. Uh, week in and week out, uh, this person says, week in and week out, Brad and Dave give excellent advice for creatives in the form of web comics, but it can be applied to any creative endeavor, all mixed with great banter, and a sense of humor. So, my friends, let's talk comics. That's fantastic. I, I yeah. gotta say, someone was asking us the other day, Brad. Uh, they're like, "Hey, I don't use Apple Podcasts. Can I rate and review yeah. you on another platform?" Absolutely. It's yeah. still appreciated if you put it on Spotify, if you put it on one of the other podcasting uh, systems and distributions. The kindness uh, it ripples out uh, and and helps the show grow. So, honestly, wherever you want to put out a kind word is very appreciated. On that note, I will say Comic Lab is made possible by your support on Patreon.com slash Comic Lab. So I'll say it like my butcher, Patreon.com. Come to Gary when you want that way. <laughs> you beef cut so perfectly, I tell you. Well, you got to ask specifically for Gary, though. These other jokers don't know how to cut their Wagyu. <laughs> I'll tell you what my pet peeves are. You got to slice the beef just right. And if you don't slice the beef just right, it's just a huge pet peeve of Gary the Butcher. Am I standing too close to you? There's, 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 a lot, there's a lot of these steak cutters. They don't know how to cut steak. I know how to cut steak. I cut on the bias, for crying out loud. A lot of these guys don't even know how to cut on the bias. These people, they just walk in off the street thinking they can cut beef. You're not Gary. Gary's been cutting beef for 25 years. Don't come at me. If you're going to come for the king, make sure it's a kill shot. <laughs>